All right, I'm just getting this webinar up and rolling. So welcome to you guys as you slowly start to arrive. Not sure how many people are gonna be joining today. The numbers tend to fluctuate pretty wildly. So it could be anywhere from say 30 people to 100 people. Um, so I guess we'll see. I suspect it'll be a little bit on the lower end today just because of the timing. The This is scheduled for a North American morning and a lot of people are gonna be at their jobs and stuff like that. So I suspect a lot of people are going to be catching the replay. So that's something that I'm going to keep in mind, but it looks like there's about 50 of you here so far. That's great to see. Feel free to say hello in the chat. Some of you guys already, um, hi Gregory, nice to have you here. Hi Sue. Uh, Marisol, um, feel free to say hi in the chat and send any comments that you want as we go through this session. I'm not going to be able to keep up with the chat, it's almost guaranteed, but what I always do at the end of every session is read through the chat comments afterwards when I have an opportunity to actually catch each comment one by one. Um, oftentimes they just go by in way too big of a stream for me to, to catch them all in the moment. One thing when you're on Zoom as well, just make sure to change your chat setting to, uh, instead of it sending to hosts and panelists, which is what it defaults to, you'll wanna change that to send to everyone because otherwise I'm the only one who's gonna see your message, no one else will. I mean, that's also fine if that's your preference, if you don't wanna have public comments or anything like that. Um, but that would be my recommend for you. And uh, we will have opportunities for a more formal Q&A at the end of today's session. And for that, we have a Q&A function on Zoom. You should see it somewhere on the bottom. And uh, at any point, if you have a question, feel free to type it in there. I'll probably address those questions all at the very end. So I'm not gonna be in the Q&A function as we go through. However, I'm probably gonna have a couple like touch points with you guys where I'll just stop, pause, make sure there's no um, significant questions about what we're talking about and I'll jump to the chat in those moments. So yeah, wonderful to have almost 60 of you here today. That's fabulous. Um, we're gonna be talking about avoiding tension at the piano. Now, I'm doing this uh, for a couple reasons. Now, I've never had any issues with, um, like I've never had a repetitive stress injury. Personally, I've managed to keep safe like the entire time that I've, you know, been playing piano. Um, so I'm very lucky in that regard. I've also been pretty careful. But I know so many musicians, whether they are drummers or guitar players, uh, especially drummers and guitar players, they seem to know a lot of those um, people who've had repetitive stress injuries. So I want to address that and how we can try to avoid having those. Since I teach group online classes now as opposed to one-on-one -on -one in person lessons it's a totally different ballpark in terms of catching people's issues because if, if i'm if i'm sitting with someone I'm, I'm pointing to my keyboard i know you can't see it in the the frame right now but if i'm sitting beside someone and they're playing piano it's a lot easier to notice in that one-on-one -on -one setting any issue that's coming up any type of tension um, any type of pain that's happening whereas when i'm teaching a group oftentimes receiving dozens of submissions of recordings, not being totally in tune with everyone's individual practice experience, it's much easier to miss these problems because I'm not literally right beside you to help you. So when I'm teaching my like complete piano path A, B, grade one classes, it can happen and it tends to happen about once per class where someone has uh, an issue where they overdid it, they practice, they have to scale back because they injured themselves. And it, I know that it's not up to me to save everyone, but I wanted to do this session with you guys because at the very least, I wanna give you some tools and some things to be watching out for and some things to be thinking about when you're playing piano so that you don't hurt yourself. However, big disclaimer, none of this is a substitution for sitting down with a piano teacher in person. So if this is something you're really worried about and you are susceptible to repetitive stress injuries and someone who would be susceptible is someone who's had an injury in the past. If you've hurt yourself in the past and you've rehabilitated yourself, you have to be extra careful that you don't go down that dark road of injuring yourself again. Um, people who are arthritic or who have other types of um, um, issues with their, their small joints and uh, muscles um, would be higher at risk. If this is you, and uh, just schedule a lesson with an in-person teacher whenever you can. It could just be a one-off, just every now and then. I know that regular private lessons are expensive, 
Um, but even just like a check-in lesson would be hugely beneficial if you want to just make sure you're not doing anything crazy. Um, in addition to some of the tips I'm going to be sharing here, but again, nothing substitutes for that in-person experience to have someone double check everything. And then of course the blanket disclaimer that I am not a medical professional. So none of this is medical advice. I really just want to give you guys some ideas on, um, how to avoid injury. So the, we're going to be talking about a few things. We're going to be talking about relaxation. Um, and I'll give you some suggestions on how to uh, find that ease when you're playing. Um, I also want to address some troubleshooting. I want to talk about some common pitfalls that people fall into and some of the things I've seen a lot that tend to lead to repetitive stress injuries. Um, once that's finished, I will let you guys know about my new classes, which are basically they're open now. They're open for the next week and um, they won't be open for another six months. So if you guys want to join my classes, I'll give you a little bit of information on that. And then we will finish with a more formal Q&A session. Ideally, this will be somewhere in the one hour ballpark. I tend to run a little bit late though. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, I think my hard limit is going to be about an hour and 15 minutes. Um, but I do, I will do my best to, to try to contain it to an hour because I want to respect your time and I don't want to, um, yeah, over linger on things and, uh, I'll try to keep things tight as best as I can. So, um, let's get started. So I want to uh, discuss and I'm going to be shifting around my camera here and there a little bit as we go. I'm going to be sharing my screen as well. So, um, so I'm doing everything myself. So I am going to have to, um, you know, there might be a couple pauses as I'm switching cameras and moving around. I'm going to have to hop to the piano a little bit today um, to give you some visual, like I'm going to try to um, position my camera in a way that's, uh, that's not the view I'm going for. I'm going to have to, ooh, I thought that would be a little easier. I'll try to find somewhere that I can stick my webcam so that you'll actually be able to see me sitting at the piano. Um, I might have to attach it to my lamp. I've done that before. So um, you can't see that behind the scenes stuff. Um, but yeah, we're going to be juggling around a little bit. But anyways, let's talk about relaxed hands. And the very first thing that I want you guys to do, and this will be a little test to make sure everything's uh, working for us here is I'm going to share my screen and I want to watch the first minute or so of a performance with you guys. And what I really want you to do is pay attention to um, their hands. I want you to pay attention to the way their hands look as they're playing. I've got Baron Boyman, Mar uh, Martha, Martha um, Agarich. So these are like absolute legends, the best of the best. Um, so it's also a really nice way to kick off the morning with some really wonderful Mozart and like classy performance. Um, but let's watch their hands and make sure all this video sharing is working properly. And then I want to talk about why their hands look the way they do and how I often see um, amateur piano players look at the piano and how their hands move and how their hands look. Okay, let's see if this works. Positive out here, uh, they're amazing. Um, so that much is obvious just from uh, watching a little bit. Oh, I just see uh, in the chat, I happen to see that uh, Monrosa said they went to uh, Martha Argerich concert, which is amazing. Um, yeah, she's she's wonderful. So, um, and of course, Baron Boyum's known for his Beethoven and stuff too. So uh, both total legends. Anyways, when we're talking about their hands, and this is where I'm going to um, switch over to my... Um, other camera and we'll see how that's looking at my keyboard. So what you'll probably notice about their hands when they're playing is there's a lot of arm movements, um, but there's not a lot of finger movement. So as they're doing these fabulous scale passages and arpeggios and chords and all those things, um, there, there's not a lot of like, like, uh, mechanical movement with their fingers. It's more with their arms and it almost looks like, um, like incredibly smooth and relaxed as they're playing, which is amazing because what they're doing is intensely detailed. There's lots of fast passages, but instead of that strain, which we see when, um, I'll actually just, um, I'm, I'm just gonna play a little something um, and I'll try to show you a comparison of what I'm talking about here. So a nice relaxed performance. This is actually a Kabalevsky piece I'm gonna play a little bit of. It's called A Little Joke from Opus 39, number six. It is, um, I believe, the very first piece we learn in Complete Piano Path B. So B is, um, for progressing beginners, B is a class where, you know, you've had about six months or so of groundwork. So it's not absolute beginner stuff. Now, um, a nice relaxed hand might look like this.
made a couple mistakes there, but you'll notice that as I'm playing it, um, I'm not uh, really pushing into the keys so much. I, I wanna show you what that would look like though. What amateur hands tend to look like when they're playing. Not sure if you noticed but um in the second way that i played my hands were working a, a lot harder they were really digging into the keys you probably saw a lot of my tendons popping out as i was playing um there was more like uh, just this kind of claw like movement so this is the most significant thing that i want to highlight to you guys and the things that uh, that really discern a, a pro even um even someone who hasn't been playing that long versus like a more amateur style of playing is finding that uh relaxation in your hands such that when you're playing your hands float on the keys as opposed to like really kind of dig into the keys with that um harsh claw like shape so i'll give you a couple suggestions on how to do this but but really be as lazy as you possibly can because minimal movement is the biggest key. Anytime we're making these fine motor movements, um, the kind of movements that are most likely to injure us is um, we have to minimize the amount of effort that we're putting in. You have to minimize your movements. And the way that we do this is we try to do a lot more movement with our arms than with our fingers. And we try to utilize gravity and momentum as opposed to entirely generating movement with our fingers alone. And uh, I see a lot of piano students, this is this is one of those um, pitfalls that, that I tend to see, but I see a lot of piano students really heavily emphasize technique and um, doing a lot of drill work. Um, like, like for example, the Hannon drills where, I can't remember exactly how the Hannon patterns work, but just spending hours and hours and hours doing this drill work. And, thinking that everything in piano is about allowing or teaching your fingers to be completely um, independent and, and moving of their own accord. There's truth in that. But for example, we have really weak outer fingers, all of us, even those of us who have been playing a long time, like the pinky and finger four tend to be really weak, right? So the, the beginner's line of thinking is, okay, well, I'll just do a lot of drill work using fingers five and four. And then they, they put a lot of physical energy trying to, to practice separating the movements of these particular digits. This causes some problems and this can cause um, injury when you're, you're it, but it makes sense, right? These are the weak fingers. So therefore I want to work them out, get these fingers more buff, um, so to speak. Um, however, when you use momentum, you take off a lot of the pressure of moving these particular digits. So if I'm, I'm just going to um, invent a passage, I'm just going to, I know this, that isn't literally what the hand and exercise is. If you tried to play this passage with just um, finger movements, well, um, what you'll see is just by using my fingers alone without any momentum, without any gravity, without any arm movement or arm weight, my fingers are doing 100% of the work. And um, this, this is not ease. This does not look relaxed when you watch me play it. This does not feel relaxed when I play it. And this is the kind of playing that's gonna possibly get you into a little bit of trouble. To make things easier for yourself, to be, to be more lazy in a productive way, you have to find a little bit of momentum. And you'll get that with a little bit of this sort of gentle rocking back and forth between the thumb and the pinky, almost like you're tilting. So the appropriate way to play a passage like this would be when I'm going from my thumb and I'm reaching up to my pinky is to, to swing my wrist in the direction of my pinky. And instead of trying to play fingers four and three and uh, five, just by kind of smacking them down digit by digit, what I'm doing is I'm tilting towards the pinky and allowing a little bit of gravity to do the work for me. So I'm gonna do this really slowly and exaggerate it a bit so you can kind of see what I'm showing you. Now I just played a little passage and what you'll notice is I tilted towards the pinky and I, I barely moved my pinky at all. The, the main way that I'm capturing that sound is like maybe 70 or 80% of just the tilting motion alone, just rotating into that pinky was enough to press it without me having to do this like really awkward and severe manual gesture. So I tilt into the pinky and then as I rotate back to the third finger, my wrist becomes 
more central. Oh, I guess you can't really see my wrist. Let me see if I can pull this back a little bit so you can. That'll probably help, hey? <laughs> I just noticed the screen. Apologies for that. Oh, also, I just um, uh, uh, want to mention also, um, before I get too into it, I want to address the hand size. I just saw something in the chat that, that made me think of this. Everyone has a different hand size and shape. Um, my hands are entirely average. They're not that big. They're not that small. They're not that skinny. They're not that wide. Um, so I'm like a kind of very, very average hand shape. It's, But these same principles, regardless of if you have small hands, large hands, um, anything in between, like thick, uh, thin, whatever it happens to be, a lot of these same principles are going to apply or cross over. So anyways, just wanted to... Um, throw that out there so you kind of know what's uh, what you're looking at anyways this idea of wrist rotation basically the idea is as you steer towards your thumb as you steer towards your pinky you're finding a little bit of oscillation let me go back to this Kabalevsky example um, I'm gonna start by playing the opening measures without any momentum or movement or twisting or turning at all I'm gonna keep all of the action in my fingers alone so my fingers are doing all the work here Now, I can pull it off. It sounds okay. Um, I'm keeping my wrists really static as I do that. However, if I were to do that for, I don't know, like 20 or 30 minutes, I would probably start experiencing some fatigue in my hands because uh, I, I'm not giving my fingers a break at all. I'm not helping them out. I'm not allowing my arms and wrists to use gravity as I do this. So a better way to play this, a lazier way, a way that's less likely to cause you tension and stress would be to lean left when I'm, I'm playing the left hand pinky and the right hand thumb. And as I get to the top notes, thumb and pinky, I start to lean right. And then um, you're kind of just, you know, towards the outer left fingers, we tilt a little left and towards the outer right fingers, we tilt a little bit right. And take a look at what my hands look like with that perspective. I could keep doing that for like easily an hour without tiring just because I've, I've simply allowed gravity to help my fingers and I'm not expecting all of my fingers, especially the outer fingers to do all the work there. So one thing I want to address too, I'm going to just switch over my camera because I want to show you guys um, and I'll try to put this on my uh, lamp here. Sorry, you're going to see like a big close up of my palm, um, but I want you guys to be able to see, oh, there's a big stack of books there. Maybe I'll, those are all my university textbooks, guys. I'm in final season. Okay, hopefully you should be able to see a little bit um, of, of what's going on in the keyboard. Um, and hopefully you'll be able to see a little bit of my posture as I do this. Posture is a crucial component of being able to not hurt yourself when you're playing the piano. And no matter how many times I talk about posture, uh, whether this is in my group classes or on piano TV videos or whatever it is, uh, this is one of those things I have to bug people about it again and again and again and again. Even students I've taught in private lessons. It's like every week I have to remind them of postures. It's, it's really common to just disregard anything about posture, especially if you get in the habit of practicing in a certain way at the keyboard. It's, it's tough to break those habits. If you feel really comfortable with the bench squished way up and you're like sitting way far back on the bench and your toes are touching the floor but you're not flat footed um this is kind of a cozy posture you can kind of slouch your back a little bit um dangle your feet even as an adult you, i sometimes see the the dangly feet thing happening that's not just kids um you can get really comfortable with a poor posture it it doesn't necessarily feel intuitively like the best posture doesn't feel intuitively like the best posture. The posture that a lot of people default to is sitting way too close. Um, so right now my bench is, let me just see if I can show you my bench here. It's pretty much right up to the edge of my keyboard. If my bench is going to be that close, <laughs> then what's going to happen is my knees, my knees are probably like here. They're really far back into the piano and my, my feet don't sit flat unless I stretch them really far back which is difficult to do with my current setup uh, this is a bad posture for a couple reasons um, first of all flat feet big thing for posture if you want to not hurt your back um, being able to just move the bench back and keep your feet firmly on the ground um, kind of I don't know I don't know why I don't know the exact mechanics of this I'm not an anatomy 
specialist, but um, the act of having your feet firmly on the ground does something to your lower back, I find. So that's why I encourage people to sit on the top half of their bench as opposed to the bottom half. Because the top half is what's going to allow you to get your feet firmly on the ground when you're playing. If you sit further back and you just kind of lounge on the back part of your bench, your feet aren't going to be firmly on the ground unless you're super tall, which most most of you probably aren't that tall. So, um, yeah, keep the bench further back because you want your knees pulled back as well. When your bench is too close, not only do your feet not touch the ground, but your elbows kind of come in awkwardly. And whenever your arm movement is restricted, so when your elbows are kind of crunched up beside you, your arm movement is super restricted. You need that freedom in your arms to do these side to side movements, to do these drops of the arms. Um, very difficult to do that when you're sitting too closely. Um, so anyways, I don't want to dwell too long on this, but uh, just a reminder to everyone, posture is crucially linked with um, repetitive stress injuries. You want to make sure you're sitting in the way that allows you to be the absolute most relaxed the entire time you play, but that doesn't translate. Relaxation doesn't translate to um, necessarily comfort. Like it's, it's way comfortable, more comfortable to slouch on the bench and kind of kick back. Um, so I'm not necessarily talking about like the, like it's harder to sit up straight. It's harder to utilize correct posture, but it allows your hands to relax and it makes it less likely that you're going to have a lot of tension in this part, especially of your arms. So, because it gives your arms more freedom to, to move. Even if I just do a scale as an example, um, it, I have, I have freedom when I'm, I'll, I'll show you this, uh, close up in just a moment, but when you're doing scales, we want to utilize that same side to side motion with our arms so we can gain some momentum and allow the momentum to almost pull our fingers to the keys as opposed to concentrating on pressing each. Like how many times have I seen people play scales? You see how hard my fingers were working there. Um, but if I get my arms involved, if I allow um, gravity to help pull me um, towards the keys by dropping into the opening note, my arms lean into them. Whoops, <laughs> can't watch uh, the screen and, and also play. I drop into it, I tilt right. Um, and I find some natural tilting. I'm really exaggerating it so you can kind of see, but I'm finding some side to side tilting as I play. Um, you can't really do that when you're sitting too close. Another thing um, is make sure your bench to keyboard ratio is, is at the right height. I find the perfect height to be one where um, your elbow has, a, it's not perfectly, um, uh, parallel? Am I using the right word there? It's not perfectly a straight line from your elbow to the keys. That's a little too low. It should be just a little bit above the keys. So where your elbow sits should hover about this much above where your wrist and fingers are sitting. So not quite even, just a little above even, but make sure it's you're not up. If you're up really high, like if, if uh, your bench is, is high, um, you get a lot of tension in this part as you play. Simply, um, I don't know, get a new bench. Uh, normally the problem isn't people sitting too high though. Um, normally the problem is people sitting too low and that's normally caused by people playing by sitting on a chair. And this is something I have to say over and over and over again, because so many people practice piano sitting on chairs instead of benches. Chairs depends on the chair you have, but they um, are often lower than they should be relative to where the piano is. So if you're playing and, and your wrist is either straight, like in a straight line from your elbow or your elbow sinks a little bit below, you get a lot of tension on the top of your hand. So this can, happen even if you're just like an inch off like it doesn't need to be a really big difference in where you're sitting to create tension it's not like you need to be way up here or way down here it's like even slight changes in your posture can make really big differences in the the comfort and ease in which you play but i want to switch back to my um, other camera view here so that uh, we can go through just a scale or two and talk about a couple um, things like that so Let's talk about falling into scales. Actually, I changed my mind. 
I'm going to backtrack a little bit. Let's talk about chords. And I'm going to talk about solid chords and broken chords because there's sort of different techniques for doing this. When you play a chord, I'm just playing a C chord in this case. Um, and apparently I'm playing it loud enough that my, my keyboard's shaking a little bit. A chord is a three or four note set of, uh, like a, a pattern of three or four notes. I'm just doing simple three note root position chords. A lot of times people take the same approach with chords that they do with scales, is that they try to make it entirely about getting all these three fingers kind of mechanically pressing the keys. But chords, if, if you just move your arm, like I can basically have my pinky, finger three and thumb on guard, kind of ready, like held in shape a little bit loosely, not tense, but loose, and just drop my arm. All I'm doing is uh, instead of hovering my fingers over the keys and trying to do all the work, just pressing with my fingers or, or um, even worse, dipping my wrist like this when I'm playing, I'm just dropping my arm on it and that gives a loose graceful look when you're playing your chords and it's also the laziest way to play your chords because it involves the least amount of effort with your fingers you're really just dropping your fingers and that's true even when you're playing inversions I'm just doing this um maybe I'm dropping my arm like this much it's a, it's a small movement and all I'm really doing is pointing my fingers in the right direction and letting my arm do the rest of the work. So this drop lift approach really helps take some of the pressure off your fingers. The other thing you can do is um, to reduce tension when you're playing chords. If you're playing a broken chord, whether that be in the right hand or left hand, you want to think about almost doing these tiny circles. So I could play a broken chord keeping my wrist totally anchored straight using just my fingers. Now, when you watch me do that, notice how much my fingers are working. Um, my fingers are, are, are doing everything. Um, and you can see it. It's visually apparent when you watch me play how hard my fingers are working as I do that. However, when I stop locking my wrist in this like kind of rigid center position and I allow it to open up and allow my wrist to start moving in these tiny circles, then all of a sudden, when my hand plays these notes, it looks like I'm barely moving at all. Compare the difference here. Versus. It's night and day, right? It's, it's so much gentler on the hands to play in these small little rotating movements where all I'm doing is leaning towards the left when I'm playing the outer left notes and then leaning towards the right when I'm playing the outer right notes, regardless of what hand I'm in. You see these like little small circles that I'm making with, with my wrist. That's how people like um, Daniel Barenboim play. They have these, these little movements with their arms and their wrists, which allows their fingers to kind of look like they're barely working because they are barely working in some sense. Um, their arm and wrists are doing so much to allow them to float over the keys. Again, like compare the different. I'm just playing a simple arpeggio. It's almost like my, I'm like accidentally falling into the keys when I watch it on the screen. Whoop. You can tell I was watching the screen there. Um, there's not a lot of digit movement, right? It's really just this sort of side to side sway. Um, whereas without any wrist rotation, we get this. You can see the tendons kind of start to pop out from my hand. You can see a little bit more of that claw shape with my fingers. Um, one thing in particular that tends to trip people up is uh, octave shapes, um, like jumping uh, in broken octaves. Um, you really want to utilize even bigger movements of the wrist to, to do um, broken octaves because it's such a big jump. If you assume a claw position shape, um, like stretching out the thumb and pinky as far as they go and then doing your octave like this, that's going to start hurting you in a minute. If you're doing solid octaves, and I did see a, a mention of this in the, the chat at one point, so that's the reason I wanted to bring octaves into this discussion briefly. Um, 
the the way that I was trained to play octaves, and octaves are still really tough, by the way, and this is not a beginner level technique. Most people shouldn't really be doing a lot of octave work until they're um, like at the grade seven, eight, nine, ten level. Like it, it's much more late, intermediate, and advanced, um, especially more on the advanced side, because it is easier to hurt yourself with octaves um, than with other techniques. But if you're doing solid octaves, a you want to drop into the octave the way you drop into a chord. Let your arm do most of the heavy lifting. Um, you also want to open up the thumb and pinky and play on just the corners. As, as uh, far away, as close to the edge as you can, the higher up the keys you play, the more stretch you're going to need to kind of, the more of this claw shape you're going to need to do. It's really hard to do an octave up here. It's a lot easier to catch the edges. So that's just like a, a little tip, but when you're doing octave work, if you can, try not to keep your hands in this like constant locked shape. Try to um, find moments where your hands kind of shrink back into a more comfortable natural position. It's almost like you're expanding and contracting, expanding and contracting um, to keep it loose. Otherwise, you're just going to kind of lock in place. This happens regardless of if you're doing octaves. Locking in place is really typical for beginners, even when doing chords. It's like you lock in this C chord shape and then your, your fingers kind of stay stuck in the C chord shape if you're doing a lot of C chords and you just hold it like a death grip. But every time you play a chord, you want to find a neutral position. Um, so if I, I'm just going to like do a little Mary had a little lamb. I'm not holding the shape. Like if, if I were pressing the chord and then I were to take my fingers off, it looks like this. Like my hand looks just like this. It's not like I'm um, straining and continuing to hold a shape. I press the chord, I let my arm fall on it. And then when I'm not pressing the chord, I'm just sort of loosely in position without like, you know, tightly holding on for dear life. One piece, I'm gonna sh uh, share my screen with you guys because I wanna show you something here. Um, on my uh, uh, my music, I'm gonna share. This is a CPPA piece that I teach. I believe it's for week 13 when we learn this one. This one has caused people problems because thirds are, you know, difficult. <laughs> They're a little bit more difficult than doing single notes, of course. By the way, for those of you who are live, you should have the opportunity to make my keyboard screen bigger if um, you would like that. Uh, if it looks like a tiny box, I think you have um, your own functionality to play around with that if you want. So um, one tricky thing, I'll, I'll just get the tune in your head. It, it's that famous uh, Vivaldi piece of music. Most of you are probably familiar with this tune. And in fact, I have a, an old piano TV tutorial from about six or seven years ago on this particular piece. Anyways, the, the thing that causes people problems in this particular piece is this thirds transition, five and three, four and two, one and three. This is a, a piece where people historically, and it, it, similar pieces too, this isn't the only piece I see people strain in, but this is where um, holding your wrist in a locked position and um, fighting with your fingers and keeping them in this kind of like locked tense position will really get you into trouble. So I, I, I see this all the time. This kind of aggressive, like uh, straining wrist stay still. Um, fingers are flying up and down the keys and holding this stiff position. Um, that will create tension within a couple minutes. You'll, you'll start to get just a little fatigue just from that. So this is where that, that principle of rotating towards the right when you're playing notes on the right, center, and a little bit towards the left when you're playing notes closer to the left side. Really come in handy. Because if you do this, this little exercise correctly it, it's almost like we start here and then we kind of topple down so gravity is going to pull you from here where i'm tilting a little bit towards the right gravity is going to pull me center and down so that passage is quite simple once you allow gravity to help your fingers fall down instead of trying to get your fingers to do all the work for you in this tense position so look at the difference in my hands between kind of this anti-wrist rotation stance. I'm, I'm gonna get sore from that really easily versus I'm, I'm landing into that top note, leaning right, and then I'm kind of just tipping down as I play. That takes 
easily 60 or 70 percent of the effort out of my fingers and you'll notice that when you see my hands do that they look like they're barely moving well <laughs> that time they barely were moving i wanted to show you also though the more relaxed you are the more capable you are of playing passages fast the fastest i could probably do it, that's probably my peak capacity um keeping that straight on position but with a little bit of tilt I, I'm all of a sudden able to go quite a lot faster and look more relaxed while I'm doing it at the same time. So that was one piece that I wanted to highlight for you. The thing is, is most repetitive stress injuries start with any kind of tension and any kind of straining. So if you're able to teach yourself to keep ease, this becomes way less likely. So how then do you keep ease? Well, everything I've already talked about before, um, kind of some of the mechanics of keeping ease when you're playing the piano. Um, but I'm gonna give you some other suggestions as well. First of all, keep the challenging drill work to a minimum, which might be a little bit uh, counterintuitive for a lot of you because a lot of beginners really like the feeling of progress that comes with uh, drilling sections over and over and over like doing a bunch of hand and exercises or doing a bunch of scales over and over um so many people i've taught like i would even say the majority of people i've taught have a habit of playing scales for like 30 minutes a day or something like that just drill work somehow feels very productive and it's not as mentally complicated as learning pieces but it gives you a bigger feeling of productivity because you can learn a scale easily and then you just do it over and over and over again. So you feel like you're accomplishing something. Whereas when you look at a piece and you try to tackle a piece, you have to work a lot harder mentally. So that can feel a little discouraging. And then you feel like it's not as productive because you're not doing these like fancy techniques, even though in the end it actually is more productive because it makes you a better sight reader. You're not um, necessarily gonna be more at risk of causing repetitive stress injuries, stuff like that. But anyway, if you are gonna be doing drill work, if you're working on a passage like I was just showing you from spring, where you're going ba da da over and over again, or if you're doing a scale or something, a couple things that you can do here. One, limit it to five minutes. Keep it like like short, snappy. Um, for all the classes I teach, for my level A, my level B, and my grade one classes and beyond, in fact, I recommend five minutes of technique a day. That's it. So five minutes of scales or chords or whatever the technical exercise happens to be for that particular week. Um, because you really don't want to overdo it. And it's better for beginners to learn how to confront sheet music as opposed to just doing this rote drill work stuff. Because um, technique comes eventually, uh, but it can't necessarily be forced by, you know, brute force. But another thing you can do is one minute on, one minute off, um, where you spend all your energy for a minute. Maybe you're trying to play something that's really fast. For example, I have to do this when I'm doing fast passages is I'll spend a minute working on it. I feel the signs of fatigue start to kick in and then I rest for a minute. Now that rest doesn't necessarily mean not playing at all. What I'll often do when I'm tackling pieces that are fast, usually there's pieces or there's at, there's there's parts of that piece that are slower. So I'll do a couple things. One, I'll um, if I'm working on a fast passage, I'll do that fast passage for a minute and try it fast and work on it. And then when I feel the fatigue after a minute or so, I do that same passage, but I do it slow. And I really concentrate on relaxation. I'm doing nothing strenuous with it. I'm, but I'm, I'm reinforcing the notes and the gestures and the movements so that when I've recovered, then I can try it fast again. And I've had the benefit of going over it another minute or so of that like kind of slow motion to make sure I'm getting it right. I'm focusing on ease, relaxation, trying to like pull out the, the tension from the experience. Um, this back and forth I find is really effective. Another thing you can do is you can spend a couple minutes in the, the more devilish or tricky part of the piece and then spend a couple minutes somewhere else in the piece that you find easy and comfortable and that doesn't cause you um, strain or stress. But this really back and forth um, is super important. The, I think like probably the main reason that people hurt themselves is because they just overdo it. So they're like, I'm going to master this passage, darn it. And then um, half an hour later, they're like, hands are falling off because they've been doing it over and over and over because they were like so intense and hardcore about just finishing it. Um, but these little incremental bits 
are more effective than trying to do everything all at once. So one thing that I, I really try to um, recommend, uh, strongly recommend and encourage people to do is not to really spend more than 15 minutes a day on a piece if you're at the beginner level. Because I, I see this habit of like grinding out like an hour's practice every day of the same piece to try to get like a finished copy after a week. Um, but you often have to work harder and you put yourself under more strain by doing a lot all at once. I think it's much better. It's, it's more relaxing. It saves you time and it saves you precious energy to do 15 minutes of a day, a day of a piece spread out over like a week or two, as opposed to trying to master something by like brute force in a few days to a week, just by practicing it over and over and over and over again, the more over and over and over and over again, you do something, the more likely you, likely you are to injure yourself. And it doesn't matter if it's a, like a scale or like a weird thirds passage or whatever it happens to be. The more in a row motions you do, that's, it's repetitive. And if you're um, tense while you're doing it, you're getting fatigued while you're doing it, it's repetitive stress. And then what follows from that for some people is injury. So you have to kind of know, you have to pull back a lot sooner than you'd like, I think, in order to um, really be safe and careful when you're playing piano. Um, one thing that I'll, I'll show you guys really quick, and then I'll get into the some of the pitfalls, which I've kind of already been discussing a little bit, is um, to, Sorry, I'm trying to just gather my thoughts here. Um, try to learn in units. Uh, this is going to make sense if I'm at the piano, um, so I can actually show you what I mean. I'm going to put the, I'm going to share my screen so you actually have some music that you can reference in front of you as well. I'm going to put uh, Tarantella. This is another CPPA piece. It's one of the more difficult ones. And I'm going to forward a little bit to the, um, the faster passage about halfway through. A lot of people tend to think of playing in terms of individual notes. So when I'm facing the right hand of this passage, I've got a um, C, B, C, D, C, B, C, B, C, D, C, B, kind of over and over. And um, people tend to tackle this by thinking of it as like individual notes all stacked beside each other. So um, kind of like that. But if you think of it in terms of gestures, for example, I just played six notes, but instead of thinking those as six separate individual units, if you think of those as two units, two gestures, and each gesture is three notes, that's a gesture. Um, uh, simply by shifting the way you approach music and tackle it um, allows you to open up. I, I find this doesn't help everyone, but I, I think this conceptual aspect of, of it helps some people. Um, if you're kind of stuck in this thing where your wrist doesn't want to move and you're like kind of training yourself to go back and forth and um, maybe you've been working at it a few weeks, but it's super awkward for you. It might help you to, to conceptually think of notes in groups as opposed to as individual units. Cause I think it's this fixation on, okay, here's a C, here's a B and here's a C, here's a D, here's a C, here's a B, like a six separate isolated entities that gets us into trouble with that um, static wrist playing. Whereas if we think about it as here's a unit um, and it's a gesture, I'm doing this little shimmy with my wrist as I play it. It's just, it's sort of like a gesture with your hand. As, uh, three notes come out of one gesture. And then we have another gesture where we're going from our four back down. And instead of thinking it as I'm pressing four, three, two individually, I'm sort of thinking of it as one movement. It's three notes, but it's one movement. Um, sometimes this, this conceptual aspect of it helps people um, open up so that instead of ending up with a performance that sounds like this, I'm going to play as an octave higher. I like it a little. That was so tense, right? You could hear it in the sound and you could also see it in my fingers. Um, there was no side to side movement. I was thinking of it very individualistic, like one note at a time. Now I'm going to think of it as gestures. Oops, sorry. It's a lot softer um, of movements and my hands float in a nice way as that happens. So those are some of the techniques that I want you guys to think about and try. 
and consider as you are um, trying to find ease in your playing. So just uh, give me a bear with me as I readjust here a little bit. Okay, so pitfalls, most common pitfalls that cause people to injure themselves. And the big one, I've already touched on this, not stopping when it hurts. So a lot of people have this attitude of like, push through the pain. I want to also discern there's a difference between, um, also I just realized I haven't checked in with you guys recently. So um, feel free to share questions in the, um, like in the, the question function on Zoom, if there's something that you want to, like really important to flag. And I'll keep my eye on the chat if um, there seems to be like a big issue that's popping up with a lot of people, because sometimes that happens. But anyway, not stopping when it hurts. So uh, pushing through the pain, what I wanted to say is there's a difference between fatigue and um, tension. They're different experiences. So tension, pain, like if you're, um, you know, getting tension in your forearm or something, it's often like kind of this sharp, I mean, a lot of you have probably experienced this, right? It's like a kind of sharp, like it's almost, a, it, it feels gross. Like I, I hate that. It's almost like it, it's got like this nerve ending feel to it. Uh, it's, it's kind of a yucky pointy sharp feeling whereas fatigue is like you know after you've had a good workout at the gym and your muscles are a little tired and maybe it's a little harder to walk up the stairs um but you're not injured you've just been working there's a difference between those two feelings and i think sometimes people make that mistake of not stopping when it hurts and they get that kind of pinchy pain and um just don't take it seriously if you at any point get that pinchy pain you just stop just stop what you're doing you don't have to stop practicing, but stop practicing what you were practicing that caused that. Um, maybe shift to really gentle stuff, play half the speed that you would normally play at. Um, but be really, if you've gotten to that point, you've kind of gone too far. Um, oftentimes there's a lot of warning signs before we get to that point. There's uh, some signals along the way. And one of those signals is fatigue. So if you find that you're playing and your hands are getting tired, What's going to happen is you're probably starting to get a little sloppier. And as you get sloppier, you're probably going to stop paying attention to like ease and comfort. You're just, I, you'll just say like, I just want to do it one more time. Okay. I just want to do it one more time. Then you keep doing that to yourself. You keep getting more fatigued. And then the more fatigues you get, the more um, strain you put on your hands to get them to do what you want. So it's kind of like, it often is this progression for people from light fatigue to more significant fatigue, which allow, which topples over all your ease and your careful practice and all those things. And all of a sudden you've got pain. So um, pay attention to those signs. Um, I don't recommend practice sessions any longer than 20 or 30 minutes at a time for people who are just starting out especially. So for people in the first couple of years, um, if you wanna practice an hour a day, divide that into two sections or even, even three um, separate sessions, um, you're way less likely to injure yourself that way. Um, so that's one. One other um, pitfall, this is another pretty typical one, is there are other stress injuries that you're, like you're doing a lot of other repetitive motions throughout the day. So classic example, my guitar player, um, of my <laughs> ex-guitar player way back in the day, um, he was on his computer all day doing graphic design. So he was like, like drawing essentially with his wrist. He played bass for a band and he was playing guitar for another band and he played a lot of video games. So it's like one of those things would have been fine, but you stack all those things up on top of each other and you've got a really big problem. So you have to be mindful of that. Like how much are you doing that uses these same kind of movements and gestures? If you are someone who does um, fine motor work on the computer, and I personally don't find typing to qualify as this. I haven't had a, an experience with typing and repetitive stress injuries, but I also don't do it eight hours a day. Um, you want to be extra cautious as you're going through this. Um, I already talked about this. Another pitfall is don't grind through the pain. Um, if you feel the pain, you got to just like put it away. You got to do something different. You got to step back. You got to scale it back. Don't practice as intense. Don't practice as hard. Utilize some of the tips that we were talking about earlier on. Try to find ease. You're always like working towards ease so that your hands float on the keys like um, Martha Argerich or, um, you know, anyone who's been playing uh, carefully for a while. Another pitfall. This is pretty common too for adults, not necessarily for kids playing above your level um, if you're trying to get really good at something that's hard and you're trying to usually do it too quickly you're going to run into to issues so if you're trying to 
do this like fast Chopin piece and you really want to be able to play it for people and show off how awesome you are at the piano, that's great. But there tends to be this like really singular focus on doing just that. And then all of a sudden you find yourself spending two or three hours a day doing this. Cause you, you're just like, I want to learn this like so fast. I want to just like deep dive this, get it figured out in a week or two, then bam, done. Um, this is not productive to do that. Um, you're less likely to hurt yourself with easier pieces uh, or pieces. I should, I should say that are at your level than pieces that you're really, really stretching for above your level. Um, I want to highlight this again and make sure that it's clear, but don't rush your learning. It's way better to do 15 minutes a day for a month as opposed to like cramming in an hour a day in a week because you're stretching out that repetitive motion. You're, you're really going to maximize your ease if you take a little bit longer and give yourself the space because again you're going to get fatigued doing the same thing over and over and over again and then you're going to get sloppy you're going to lose your carefulness um we talked about this as well pitfall i'll just highlight it really quickly overly using your fingers um like i was showing you like the uh, as opposed to allowing your wrist to open like you're locking your wrists um poor posture those all play into it of course too um if you can't find ease in a really simple and slow piece, you're never going to find it in a more complex piece. So I, I always recommend like start, if you've been playing piano for a while and this is an issue that you struggle with, just get like the most beginner book you have, learn like the most basic beginner exercise you can find and find something so easy that all you have to think about is just um, getting as relaxed as possible as you're playing. Um, to scale it back a little bit. It's kind of hard to teach yourself ease when you're doing um, pieces that require the majority of your mental bandwidth to play. Um, finally, being too ambitious with fast pieces, and not just fast pieces, but being too ambitious with pieces that introduce a new technique. So the example I showed you with spring, ba -da 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 -dum -da -da -dum, that harmonic thirds pattern is a new pattern to most people when I teach that in lesson 13. So since this is a new technique and they've never really done it before, um, they're going to fatigue really fast with that technique because it's new. Now, if you've been playing thirds for years, you're going to encounter thirds in your page and it's not going to fatigue you because you kind of already know how to deal with it. You've already built those neural connections, um, muscle memory connections, whatever it happens to be. But anytime you encounter something new, even if it's not fast, you want to be mindful of the fact that you, you kind of are going to have to build in those connections and uh, you're more likely to harm yourself in that instance. Again, I think that's one of the reasons that this piece um, tends to be a problem for people in terms of um, like getting fatigued and, and uh, over overly tense when playing it just because it's new. It's a new movement. Um, and like I said just a moment ago, fast pieces as well, like overdoing it with with fast movements. If you haven't learned how to be relaxed when you play slow, and then you try to, um, like maybe you're speeding up a piece or trying to get it like as fast as you can. Um, you're basically just going to accelerate the speed of your tension. So tension that you have that you might not notice when you're playing slow will become very apparent when you're playing it fast. So I think it's really important to get a good grip on um, proper uh, posture and, and ease and stuff like that when you're doing slower things um, so that you don't injure yourself when you're doing faster things. So have I... Um, sufficiently freaked all of you guys out. Uh, that's the gist of what I wanted to share with you. So um, now I'm, I'm going to just turn to, uh, I've been talking a lot about the, the CPPA and B lessons. So I just want to give a quick, um, I'm going to quickly share my screen just to let you guys know what's going on. And I will hop to the questions in just a moment. So please, um, if you have any questions about what we've been talking about, um, please feel free to throw your question in the Q&A function. There's four questions right now. Um, I don't know how many I'm going to have time to get to, but uh, um, you feel free to throw them in there. It looks like there's room. Okay, so um, I teach on, most of you guys know this already, so I don't want to over explain, but I teach online classes, um, groups of adults. So basically the way it works is I give you guys um, lessons. So there's lessons for each and every week. I think I have CPPA loaded up here on the screen. This is what it looks like when you're a student. So it's like every week there's a new lesson where you um, get an introduction, all the downloads, like sheet music, stuff like that. And um, like I, I give technique and sight reading and all the, that kind of stuff as well. Um, and then I also give tutorial videos. So you 
like I teach you how to do a five finger scale and tonic and dominant seventh chords and how to play the piece of the week. And then um, that's that's kind of like the first segment of it, the main segments, um, the bulk of lessons. And then I also do feedback sessions after each week. So I do three times a month of feedback session for each class. And uh, they're usually between an hour to an hour and a half in length and we'll meet um, typically Tuesdays. And uh, yeah, kind of like kind of like today. Um, but then I'll listen to approximately 15 recordings that people have shared. And depending on what point of the class it's in, I might get to yours or not. So some people, um, like in the first month or two, I'm probably not getting to anyone more than uh, every couple weeks because there's usually a higher volume of people sharing their music. It does tend to level off in the second half of classes where I tend to get to everyone every single week. Um, again, it totally depends on the volume of submissions. I do cap it off at 15. And I do have a piano teacher in the forum who provides additional text feedback to people um, to keep that kind of uh, momentum going. But yeah, those are the two components. So the lessons on like all 21 lessons uh, on CPPA, there's 20 lessons in CPPB. Each are about five-ish months each. So um, this takes you through like the entire beginner level of piano. CPPA is total beginners, but it does move fast. And B doesn't move quite as fast. It's a little more measured, but there's still a lot to learn, a lot of different rhythms and stuff that come into play with um, the B class. And the way that, uh, if this is something that um, you're interested in joining, the way I would evaluate which class would make more sense to join is, where you're at or how well you would do with a metronome, uh, metronome, a method book of a similar level. So if you've never played at all or you've barely played, then obviously the A class would make the most sense. But where it gets more like a little bit more dubious is if someone's been playing for six months, a year, maybe a year and a half, like somewhere in that range. And they're not really sure, like, am I a beginner? Or am I a little past the beginner stage? If you would be able to pull out a level two adult method book whether it be Alfred's or Piano Adventures and kind of start working your way through that, then that's going to line up with CPPB, where CPPA would line up a lot more nicely with method book number one. So if you're in, say, like halfway through Alfred's A, um, and maybe you're finding it pretty tough, then you'd probably want to do the whole A class. Whereas if um, you're doing Alfred's adult book two, and you're like halfway through that one, then you almost certainly wouldn't need to go back to the beginning unless you felt like you were really missing some significant fundamentals. So anyway, this is just like the main part of how the courses are taught. You can kind of self, self, like go through this on your own time. And then we meet for feedback sessions where I give, we listen through recordings that are submitted and I spend like a few minutes giving personal feedback, which benefits the group because we're all working on the same piece together every week. And that's the, the flow of um, like five months or so with a short break thrown in there. So if you want to check it out, um, it's very easy to find the pages. You can go to pianotv.net slash cppb or cpp-a, either one is totally fine, um, and check out more about that. I just also want to show you this aspect of it. So this is our, our hub. This is our private forum. Only people who are actively participating in the courses are in this forum. So it's not available to the public at all. Um, and every group has its own little category. So for the people who joined my grade one class in January, this is basically the place where we post, like I'll post feedback session links where we can kind of see um, the video recordings that people are submitting and I can select from there and uh, et cetera. You can start a progress log and all those good things. So between the Zoom feedback sessions and the forum where everything is centralized and then the, the teachable classes, that is essentially how, um, how I teach now as opposed to doing private lessons. I've been doing this since the end of 2019 and um, it's, it's wonderful. I love doing it. It's, uh, I, wanna, I wanna keep doing this as long as I can. I think the only thing that I'd wanna say is the more new classes I open, um, the more I realize that at some point I am not going to be able to do everything by myself. Um, which is what I usually do. I usually schedule everything. I usually I usually do it all by myself. Sometimes I get friends to help out a little bit with, um, uh, like I have friends who are good at designing web pages and I have friends who are good at video editing. I have friends who are good at um, sending emails and every now and then I'll, I'll get a little bit of help with that kind of stuff. And I also have a piano teacher in the forum, like I said, named Anna. Um, she's an old coworker of mine, so I've known her for many years. Um, but I am starting to confront the fact that at some point I will need to hire another piano teacher to also provide feedback. 
And that's probably great for you guys too, because I think you guys will get sick of me um, giving you feedback week after week. I think it would be really nice to have another person or two to provide feedback on some weeks. And the reason I'm sharing this with you now, because um, I know some of you on this call are existing students. Um, some of you might be curious about joining. Um, I'm just telling you, because this is something that's probably going to happen within the next six months. Um, I probably am going to start seriously looking for a piano teacher um, to start helping with some of the feedback and diversifying a little bit of the feedback so you're not just stuck with me all the time. Um, and I think that'll be a really great experience. Actually, on that note, please send me an email if you know a great piano teacher because I'm starting from scratch. I don't uh, have anyone in mind um, to do this. So uh, I'd love any suggestions that you guys might happen to have. Um, final note on this that I want to share is if you guys are um, planning on joining my courses, anyone who joins a course from the webinar or from my mailing list or from the existing class, like people who are already in the courses, I always give you guys uh, like a coupon code, like a discount for 20% off. Um, I want you guys to have the, the best price, of course. So the code for that is CPP web gift, as in like CPP for complete piano path, web as in short for webinar and then gift well you guys know what that is so make sure you apply that like like please take your discounts um, and that that applies on um both the full price version of the course and the monthly installment version whichever you prefer so um that one more time that's cpp web gift uh, really really important i want you to use that okay so i'm gonna jump into some questions now all right i'm going to try to i'm just skimming these so bear with me i want to um try to find preference for questions that are really directly relevant to the um like the all the, the posture and tension and stuff we've been talking about so holly's asking i'm going to share this question with you so hopefully you guys can see it what about exercises or stretches to relax the neck shoulders arms and hands before or during playing uh this is a great question uh i don't actually so some of you might have read my ebook that I have available for free on the website. I do have some stretches and stuff listed in there. I used to do them, and that was the reason I, I included them in the book. Um, I don't actually do any of that anymore. I'm totally out of the habit. I actually, um, I don't warm up my body before I play piano. I used to. I think um, it didn't seem to make a difference for me. Uh, it might make a difference for you depending on um, how, how inhibited you are. What I will say is for the last probably nearly a decade. I've been doing yoga of some form fairly consistently, sometimes more consistently than other times, but not right before I go to piano, but at various points in time, I'm working on those exact things. Um, I'm working on neck stretches and I'm working on loosening up my shoulders and I'm working on my posture um, via doing yoga at other points. I think that's like so underrated as being important for, um, yeah, just I, I, like when I'm sitting at a desk, when I'm hunching over books studying, when I'm practicing piano, I'm doing all these hunching motions. So that yoga to like force force me into some back bends and to open up my shoulders and stuff, uh, huge, huge. Um, so I don't have any specific exercises aside from what's outlined in the book. Um, like upward dogs and back bends and stuff are great. Um, even just like simple neck circles are, are really quite lovely. Um, but just like a, a generic yoga routine, I feel like is awesome for that kind of thing. Uh, especially if you're a really tense person. Um, and yeah, I am, uh, I just thought, uh, nice to have you here, Kristen. Um, and I am running over as anticipated. So I'll probably hang out for another five or 10 minutes to answer questions. And then I will um, let you guys go. Thank you to everyone. If you have to go, that's totally fine. Um, I will be emailing you with the webinar replay as well. Um, so that's something that's, because uh, yeah, not everyone's able to attend this live. If you want to catch the end of it later or whatever, that's totally fine. Um, you will get that email from me. And um, yeah, I'm just gonna answer this one quick, uh, quickly from Marisol. Oops, I don't wanna type my answer. Let's try that again. There we go. All right, what if my hand is too small for a chord, like an octave chord? Do not octave chords um, in the meantime. So I, I think sometimes, okay, I'm gonna use my mom as an example. My mom has tiny hands. She's like a little baby hands. and she's able to play octaves and it's like even though she has small fingers it's less about the finger size it's more about the reach 
So it's more about the, like, are you able to, like, I can basically create a, a 180 degree angle between my thumb and my pinky. I can stretch them out. But a lot of people can't stretch their pinky out any more than this, like the distance between their, their thumb and pinky. Um, that hand opening, I find, comes from just time and practice. If you're practicing piano every day, um, you'll see this with people who've been playing since they were kids um, pretty consistently. This is why my hand's so stretchy, is you're just opening up your hands every single day. And over time, you are going to have a more open hand shape just by doing that. You can't really force it though. So that's why if you're playing right now um, and you can't do octave chords, I would just take out the octave, like take out the bottom note, take out the top note. In time, like the more you play, the more open your hand gets. And depending on what level you're playing at, beginners shouldn't be doing octave chords anyway. Octave chords are again, something that, um, I don't even think the Royal Conservatory of Music requires you do them until like a grade nine or 10 level. And for most people, like by the time you're at that point, you've been playing for nine or 10 years. So um, try not to um, get too, I know it's unfortunate, but this also happens with people with larger hands too. So it's not just a small hand person problem. Um, if really anatomically, like your, your fingers are too tiny, I don't know like if there's any other thing I can tell you aside from no octaves for you. I don't know. But that I don't think I've ever seen a hand so small aside from a kid's hand um, that, that can't do an octave. Okay, I'm going to answer a couple more. Um, oh, uh, Tolu, I just kind of answered this a little bit. So I'll just put your question over there. Um, what exercises are there for stretching small hands? I don't think there's, I, I'm not aware of a particular exercise that helps open up the hands. The only thing that I've seen consistently over time is consistent overtime practice. The more you are um, doing chords uh, in the left hand, the more you're doing like uh, any type of movements in the right hand, you're just practicing that opening um, of your hands. Uh, but if you just kind of sit there with your hands open and you try to like stretch your pinky or something, I don't think that's going to get the same effect as just like consistent daily practice, which I know isn't an ideal answer because you probably want something that will help you now, not help you five years from now. Um, but that's, that's all I've got, honestly. Um, there might be answers that I'm not aware of. Okay, I'm just going to scroll through here. Oh, Howard's got a good question with this. Um, a few people, myself included, oh, I just lost the question. Sorry, guys, I got to click through a couple screens here. Um, get tense when playing for their teacher. I can play a piece fine in practice and fall apart when playing for my teacher. Me too. This totally happens to me and I'm a piano teacher. I get it. Um, this is a different sort of tension. This is like a this is like a mental tension that creates physical mishaps and like more tension in person. Um, the thing that I found is if I go into my piano lesson after practicing a piece for a week, and I feel pretty good about that piece, it's probably gonna fall apart because I've only been playing it for a week. But if I go into that lesson with a piece that I've been working on for three or four weeks, um, I'm much less likely to fall apart because there's just so much more muscle memory that's built in. When a piece is fresh and new, um, you can kind of get there on your own, usually after a few tries, um, but that, that fresh and newness, you're not gonna be able to, like when you're nervous and when you're panicking a little bit, you have no muscle memory to fall on, uh, just like tiny little bits of muscle memory because it, it's still too fresh and new, right? It takes pieces time to like sink into your muscles. It takes time for pieces to sink into your brain. And this is a, a rate of speed for that's different for different people. Um, one thing you could try, I'll give you one suggestion on this. Sit down and try to play your piece cold. And all I mean by that is a lot of times when we practice, we sit down and play something for 15, 20, 30 minutes, and we do it over and over and over again, and then we're pretty good by that last repetition. But how good is your first repetition? If you haven't been playing all day and you sit down and try to play something cold, no warm up, no prep, how does it come out? Does it, is it like uh, kind of messy and sloppy? How's your muscle memory? Um, you could also practice playing in front of other people that aren't your teacher to kind of get you used to the nerves, but I, I really think it's mostly a muscle memory issue at that point. And I should say most piano teachers are understanding of that. Um, every single time, like every day I used to teach, it's probably an exaggeration, but almost every day, um, I would have someone say like, oh, I could do this at home. It's very common. We all see it. Um, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Okay. Okay, I'm going to answer, uh, Jonathan's got a good question. It's a little bit longer, but I'll, um, I'll read through it here once I get to the right screen. Doop, doop, doop. 
Okay, my electric piano has 88 weighted keys to simulate a real piano. But I find it requires a lot more force to play the keys, especially chords or passages. I also have a smaller semi-weighted MIDI keyboard, which is a lot easier on the hands. It's 49 keys. It probably um, doesn't have weighted keys, I think. Oh, semi, semi-weighted, you said. Um, I just tried your suggestions to let gravity do the work and lightly let my fingers drop, but it doesn't seem to work so well with the weighted keys. Um, definitely don't switch to semi-weighted keys. This is probably more of an issue of if you're used to playing with lighter keys. I've, ha- I've seen this with people before, too, where... Um, you kind of get used to how easy it is to press a, a like a lightly weighted key. And then when you get to a real piano or an electric piano, it's like, oh, it feels like um, like so much resistance. I think this is more just like uh, getting acclimated to it because that's how a piano should feel. I think my keyboard's keys are kind of light for being a, a weighted keyboard. Some are heavier than others. You could always explore different keyboards and see how they feel. Maybe yours is particularly heavy. Um, but acoustic pianos tend to be really heavy. It's, it's good for you to play with keys that are heavier because that, that will allow you to, it just seems to allow people to develop better technique for one reason or another without getting into like a full explanation on why that is. Cause I don't think I have a great answer for that. Um, I would just encourage you to work with it and don't overdo it, but see if you can acclimate to the heavier keys, um, just don't practice the little one at all. Like try to, I don't know, maybe for the next two weeks, just do, you know, 15, 20 minute practice sessions on the new one and see what happens. Uh, anyways. Let's go. I'm going to do a couple more here. Oh, this is kind of a specific question. I don't have a good answer for it, but I'll bring it up. Um, what's for a five foot one individual, what height should the piano be at? It depends how big your torso is because someone who's five foot one might have long legs, short torso or long torso, short legs. Cause it's really about like how high is your torso hovering above the keys, right? Um, so you're going to need to, again, when I was talking about the, the elbow bend, that's going to be your guide. Um, are your elbows sloping about this high above your wrists or are they equal with your wrists? Or are they below your wrists? Use that as your um, guide as opposed to height. Um, Cause yeah, torso size matters a lot for that. Uh, Angela, nice to see you on here. I think this will be my last question, you guys, um, just so I don't overdo it here. Are there only a few main technical gestures, like wrist circles, rotation, drop lift, um, such as the two note slurs? And how does someone know which to apply to what on a passage? Yeah, um, to keep it simple, yes. And I think, I don't want you to think in terms of them being as like totally separate things, because dropping and lifting and rotating side to side are different um one's using your arm one's tilting your wrist a little bit more but whether or not you're doing circles or you're kind of seesawing a little bit with your wrist or you're doing a little bit of wrist swinging or whatever it happens to be it's all kind of the same thing so it's not that there's just one technique and that technique is wrist circles or there's like other variations on that it's more like just being mindful of when you're playing notes on the right side, tilt right. When you're playing notes on the left side, tilt left. And whether that ends up meaning that you play with circles or you kind of play with just rotating or whatever motion your wrist ends up making, allow it to be the most natural one. And that'll kind of just resolve itself if you're putting emphasis on that side to side movement as you're going right to left. I don't know if that made sense. It's a little bit abstract to um, to explain, but, uh, how does someone know which to apply to what on a passage? I, again, I would just say anytime you're playing a little towards the left, tilt a little left, anytime you're playing a little towards the right, tilt a little right and let that be your guide and let that be your rule and let everything else fall where it falls. Um, and then drop lift. This is, uh, this is a part of it. Um, I, I don't want to go too much into this, but when you are playing a scale, you drop into the note that you start with, and then you kind of tilt as you go. So it, it, it's really part of like, um, the same technical process. It's just, it's part of using your arm and your wrist. It's all kind of the, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's all kind of the same thing. Um, it's just like little aspects of the same thing, but I don't think there's Maybe there is. Please let me know if there is. But I don't think there's like extra techniques in addition to that. Um, anyways, I think I'm going to wrap things up here. So I'm going to stop. I, 
kind of forgot I was sharing my screen. Sorry about that, guys. Um, sorry I didn't get to all the questions. I seldom do, but thank you for submitting them. Thank you all for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Um, it's been ages since I've done a webinar. I don't know if you guys know this. Um, some of you will, but I started going back to university and taking full-time classes. So um, between teaching um, my regular classes and doing that and also caring for a four-year-old, um, I, I just haven't really figured out how to get on a regular schedule with making YouTube videos and doing that side of things. So that's one of my goals actually for the spring. I want to, now that I'm, I'm in the school zone and I kind of know what it's like now and I know how to manage my time for it a little bit better. I think I have a much better sense of how to um, bring my, uh, bring my work uh, and connecting with you guys kind of back into it so that it's not like completely abandoned. I do intend to do these every month um, and I'll keep you posted via email about the next one. Uh, yeah, Charles, I just saw this. Charles said, hard to believe it's been four years since 30 days of piano. And when I see that, I'm like, oh, only four years ago. I feel like that was like 10 years ago. I don't know why. It just seems like a different life. So um, anyways, wonderful to have you here. I'm going to let you go. Take care, everyone, and talk to you soon.